computer. So, um, like, I think it was probably about 1979 that I first started learning how to program wow. in Fortran. Oh. And I was born in 73. So, wow. me? Exactly the same age. That's funny. What, what, when's your birthday? Uh, November 8th. I'm um, almost a year older than you. Sorry. Mm. <laughs> so now everybody knows my birth date and I'll be, uh, <laughs> I'll have, uh, I'll have, uh, there'll be lots of credit cards taken out in my name now. <laughs> <laughs> so, Why haven't you a software to prevent that? Well, I haven't because you know what? He, uh, John asked me, what haven't I done in computer science? And one of those things is security. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have read papers on computer security. Mm. I have, you know, worked with, I've worked with people who do computer security, but, mm. you know, it's just not something I've ever gotten into. Mm. Uh, how do you hack into, how do you break into software using yeah. various kinds of software exploits? I know a little bit about how that works, mm. but it's, it's, a, it's a constant battle, isn't it? Between one immune system and, and one diseased hacker. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyway, we took you off your story. My fault. Sorry. That's quite all right. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, through the 80s, I programmed 8 bit computers and, uh, you know, was learning programming languages along the way. I, let's see. I got an undergraduate degree in computer engineering in 1996. And then I went to work in the computer industry for a company that, they called TechSource, where we did um, air traffic control display systems. And it was about the year, about 1999, when we couldn't get a graphics chip anymore that, so I was doing graphics drivers. Okay, so it's a part of the user interface system that takes uh, uh, um, the, like what the applications wanna draw on the screen and converts that into commands to the hardware to actually draw those things. Okay, so the so I did the software drivers. So, um, so by but around ninety nine, we couldn't uh, get an off the shelf chip anymore that did what we needed. And at that point, I was the expert at what chips the chips needed to do. So they asked me if I wanted to learn circuit design, and I did. And so now, when when you fly over several different countries, you're at the mercy of a graphics accelerator chip that I designed. <laughs> in the air traffic control towers driving the displays. Um, and uh, so about 2004, 2005, I went back to school because the company I was working for wasn't doing well financially. Got a PhD in computer engineering. Uh, started out doing artificial intelligence, actually. But that didn't work out so well. I don't think I was that great at it. I mean, I'm okay at it. Like, I'm a decent practitioner at machine learning but I'm not really good at it, right? But also my advisor retired, so that didn't help. So uh, so a, a guy five years younger than me was hired at Ohio State to, to, to teach computer architecture. And, uh, and so I decided to switch to that and it was fairly easy to get started on that because I already knew tons about it. I'd been reading articles on it for years. So I switched to that um, and over next like took like maybe another two years and I finished the PhD. Um, then I went to Binghamton University in upstate New York um, and taught computer architecture at the graduate level for six years. Um, and then uh, that didn't work out <laughs> for various reasons, um, some of which were health related. And so I went back to the industry, worked for the company that bought TechSource for a few years, but now I work for Amazon Web Services. Yeah, you, well, they should be a pretty safe support employer. <laughs> I wanted to ask, Tim, do you get toilet breaks? You work for Amazon. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you were cutting out, sorry. Oh, sorry, it's bandwidth, apparently. Uh, okay, so I, I work from home. Uh, so I, I probably don't get the joke um, because <laughs> you know, the thing is, I don't, I've never talked to anybody who like works in one of the warehouses. Right. Uh, 
So, you know, I work in, in engineering. Amazon Web Services is all software stuff. And I work for a, a subdivision of that called Athena uh, that specializes in what we call serverless databases, which I can tell you about if you want. Um, but uh, yeah, I work from home. Um, it was once the pandemic hit, a lot of IT companies, the big ones yeah. like Google and Microsoft, ha- uh, oh. figured out that, you know, everybody was working from home anyway because they had to isolate. Um, yeah. But everybody was being perfectly productive. Mm. So so there was this huge shift in the IT industry where the company started to realize it's, it's cheaper and no less productive to have people working from home. So they yeah. shifted to uh, not even caring where you are when they hire you now. Yeah. So uh, uh, Am- Amazon found me on uh, LinkedIn and, you know, we uh, went through an interview process and they're like, yeah, maybe uh, sometimes you'll have to go to New York City. And I've been working there since November and haven't had to. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, just I, I have a laptop here that belongs to them and I do my work on it and mm. avail myself of hardware at, uh, at in the in the Amazon cloud services that if I had to pay for use of myself, use of it myself would, you know, cost more than my house per year. <laughs> so well, we couldn't have done this in the eighties, could we? I mean, when computers were really in their infancies and, and I considered myself to be an early adopter because I, I got a home computer before the school had one, you know, <laughs> And this was back in, must have been 1984, I think. So it, it was a BBC. I don't know if you're familiar with those. Um, yep. They've died out now, of course. But the BBC sort of exceeded its remit and became a commercial organization for a while. That got stomped on. But yep. Amazon is one of the companies that's very enlightened. It's just recently joined a list of major U.S. companies that have offered to pay the fares of their employees who need to get an abortion in another state. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, I, I get the emails about that, right? Yeah. So. Okay. I expect you do, yes. I, I, yeah. No, I mean, if, so, you know, definitely one of the things that um, attracted me to Amazon was that, you know, well, you know we live in uh, the United States. I live in the United States where people don't think that healthcare is very important. <laughs> the, where the government doesn't think that healthcare is very important. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're, we, we haven't moved into the 21st century and, ha- and decided to create a, you know, universal healthcare for people. Yeah. So, um, you know, so going to am- work for Amazon meant that I was going to get really good medical insurance and yeah, they really take care of their employees. Yes. So. Yes. That's good to know. Uh, something that is interesting about you, um, Timothy, is that you, you and I are about the same age, but uh, you started programming computers when you were five. Now, I matriculated or finished school in 1990. And when two years before that, there was the revolutionary introduction of uh, computer science as a subject in my high school. Mm-hmm. It's about 10 years behind the time. So isolation uh, from what goes on in the world has really had an impact. I, I think South Africa is caught up, but I just found it interesting. To, w- w- people who think that being isolated and, you know, governments and things like sanctions, we say it doesn't harm anybody. Um, I wonder how many of my peers would have had a better chance, even myself, because I had so little exposure to computers that I discovered that I actually like coding and I did a little bit of app building in my late forties. And one of the reasons I never knew about that ability that I had and that I liked it is because I was never exposed to it until, you know, so so, yeah, that's quite, quite, uh, it's, it's sad in a way, I suppose, but uh, I'm uh, I'm the opposite. I just, I just want to drive them. I, I want to you know, get behind the steering wheel. I'm not interested in what goes on under the bonnet at all. <laughs> well, well no, nor do I, but, but that, that, that's something that I, I was thinking of um, asking Tim, you know, I'm, I'm in the humanities. That's my field of expertise, but I have, I'm, I have tried my hand at app designing and, um, and I enjoy understanding programming. I, I, 
and I often wonder whether there shouldn't be more of a an integration between the 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 computer nerds and the philosophers and the humanities people because after all computers are tools that humans use mm -hmm. and I think there's a little bit what would you say if I said that I think there's too much of a divide between the maths and science type person and the humanities type person we, we I don't think it should be like that and I don't think it's I think it's detrimental I don't think I think those two fields or of or areas of expertise should be integrated mm -hmm. um as as students learn how to program because you the human element's always there what would you say to that well I think that what you're talking about speaks to a more general um concept of of, of diversity um in any field or any you know, any kind of work that we want to do where, um, you know, or in this case, maybe we want to call it cross pollination, right? Where people of different fields get together and they share knowledge with each other. Um, you know, the, when whenever you have people in an organization who have different perspectives, come from different backgrounds, then those people have uh, been exposed to different ways of solving problems in their lives. And then they can come together and, and, you know, a solution that I wouldn't have thought of, maybe you will think of, right? Because you have different background or, you know, different psychology, any of these things. Um, and so, you know, uh, modern companies that have moved into the modern age have have realized this, right? That, that it's not uh, IBM of the 1950s where it's all uh, white men in uh, in these horrible looking suits, right? It's everybody who can get, get involved, you know, makes... A, a better organization. So, um, you know, when you have like an academic environment, um, the, the university is a whole, right? Uh, it, that with many different fields. And I think that if, if we can learn to understand and respect each other's perspectives and, you know, what do we contribute to the world that's different from each other, um, then, you know, that makes a better and better educational environment. And, wow. you know, it, it, it you know, let me let me let me give you like uh, kind of an example that speaks to this. Um, when I was in getting my PhD in computer engineering, I uh, I took advanced computer science classes, and they were challenging, but they weren't anything like completely outside of what I was familiar with. Right? It was just more advanced versions of what I knew. Um, but I also took a bunch of courses in, ling in linguistics and compute and uh, cognitive engineering, cognitive science, uh, psychology, that kind of stuff. And uh, they, what I found was that when I when I took these courses, I had to think in very different ways yeah. from what I was used to. And so I didn't just come away learning something. I felt like I came away changed. And, you know, like I was, you know, I grew as a human being because I, I learned to think about things in, in very different ways from what I was used to. Right. Um, and, and so, you know, uh, the, there, there's a, there's a, a, there, there are many ways in which we can help ourselves be more effective as human beings in the world by exploring things that we yes. don't know about. And that, you yes. know, and, and how are you going to do that if you don't work with those people, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, that's, yeah. that's all good. I like all of that. Yes. We should be more outward looking, more inclusive, more tolerant of change rather than fixed in our own little furrow. Mm -hmm. And what we're talking about now, it's interesting to me because I'm an ex-teacher and uh, so do do we is this a case of it, it's nature versus nurture isn't it because like um Tercia said some of us have aptitudes for one side or another one either maths or languages and uh, she she talked about um a computer type person and a, and a literature type person and i'm wondering how much of that is actually stereotyping or how much of it is innate? I mean, are these are these differences something that we develop uh, biologically, 
maybe inherit, maybe not something that's imposed upon us afterwards, but we've genetically got from the from the start. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes me wonder, because I know quite a few people who are good at, um, at computer work and don't really like going out to meet fleshy humans, you know. <laughs> they're, they're happy at home with their keyboard. Is this a sort of, uh, I don't know, is, it a, a, is there a sort of autism connection there or...? I mean, there there might be. Um, I, I I have a few thoughts on this. Um, you know, there are people who are good at technology, but I've met lots of people who had computer science degrees who were not very good at it and not that enthusiastic about it, mm -hmm. or or they're not enthusiastic about it, but they're they're competent, right? So as humans, we're perfectly capable of gen general learning. Right. And and so you'll there are lots of people who go into an IT field or some kind of STEM field because their families push them into it or they think it'll make them money or, or whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they do OK. Right. They're not super like, uh, um, you know, they're not uh, passionate well, about it. Right. Yeah. But they're they're perfectly capable of doing it. Um, and uh, and so. Yeah, I, I think that, like me, I grew up as uh, one of these kids who destroyed a lot of toys because I took everything apart. <laughs> <laughs> but so, we, had, we had Meccano for that back in my childhood. Yeah, no, and I had I had um, a rector set and Tinker Toys and things like that. I built all kinds of Legos. I built all kinds of stuff with those. Yeah, but Lego is a pale imitation of Meccano. You could make anything with Meccano, making it work as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I built a lot of things out of, uh, well, a rector set and Meccano, I think, are kind of similar. Um, and so I do think that there is uh, some, there are natural inclinations that people have. Yeah. Um, but you know, like I'm really interested now in learning languages, but and really? there are certain things that I seem to be naturally good at that I'm very uh, that have an easy, relatively easy time at. Um, mm -hmm. Like phonology is an area of linguistics that uh, mm -hmm. I just pick things up. Okay, so um, you know, with some practice, I can do a decent job at pronouncing things from another language. Sometimes, with some languages, it takes more work than with others, but I can usually get there. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, vocabulary is something that I really, really struggle with. So if yeah. I could, if I could pick up vocabulary easily, I'd be fluent in several languages already. Yeah. But it's yeah. it, it's like pulling teeth. Um, so yeah. you know, I've I have figured out a strategy, you know, in my forties. <laughs> but um, uh, and it's really just down to hard work, right? So yeah. there are a lot of things that all of us can do that are we're not necessarily. Uh, you know, we don't necessarily aren't handed the the raw talent for these things to do it easily, but we can do it if we really yeah. put the effort into it. Yeah, I relate to that entirely because uh, I, I my my love, if you like, apart from science, is words. I like I like writing. I like playing with words, composing things, and I can do maths. But there's no joy. There's no joy in it. I don't have a passion for it. So I watch YouTube channels where, where the, the, this one guy says, let's do some math for fun. <laughs> do maths. I, I don't even do maths. But, but John, I just want to comment, make this comment that I think when I grew up in the 80s and 90s, there definitely was more of an inclination to stereotyping these the nerdy math thing type person yeah. and the more arty type person. I think, yeah. fortunately, I'm very glad that has changed a lot. Um, I think it's one of the good things of, of the modern age because I always saw myself as not the maths type, you know, because I, I struggled with maths, and uh, but, but I enjoyed it. It's, so mm -hmm. despite struggling with it, I enjoyed it. And because I was because words and, and, and composing and writing and reading came easily to me, um, there was this divide. Whereas now I've learned that maths is just another type of language. If somebody had told me that 
then maybe all the mental blocks that I had against, because it isn't my natural inclination. So I think that's one of the very good things about yeah. um, the time that we are living in now and, and encouraging, especially girl children, um, oh. female children to, to not see themselves as fitting into certain roles. But yeah. um, John, if, if you don't mind, I want to ask, I, I must confess that I didn't read up on it, but you said, John, that you are, you understand, have some understanding of Moore's law and Timothy it came up when I looked at your bio as well. So could you please enlighten me between the two of you about what, what is Moore's law? And, uh, and, and then I want to ask whether we, the, about the Turing test. Okay, so can I can I leave those two ideas there, please? Do you, do you want me to handle that? Yeah, I sure do. Okay, yes. okay. So, <laughs> Moore's law is not really a law. It is a, it's an observation, and it's 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 a it is a statistical observation. Um, it's a, basically a function of semiconductor manufacturing technology that uh, over time. Uh, okay, so we started out with vacuum tubes, right? And then we moved to discrete silicon transistors, okay, as the switching components and circuits. And over time, we've put more and more transistors onto a single chip. And the rate at which um, manufacturers were able to increase the number of transistors increased at an exponential rate. That was something that I think was observed in the 60s or 70s that there had been this trend that about every year, year and a half, two years, somewhere around there, the number of transistors or the the uh, or well, that's one of the things that they looked at uh, would double about. Uh, would, would about double okay but you'll notice it's not a strict amount of time right that as the technology has changed how long it takes to double is somewhere between a year and two years and it's actually slowed down in recent history because we're starting to get down to the atomic scale um so i mean i can go into some some depth about the you know the 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 physical transistors and how and what's what's you know what how that well, affects you, this but yeah you have lost me already <laughs> well, okay so at, at this point can i bring my yeah you you, you you try to uh let's yeah, <laughs> give a shot <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's see if i can bring my teacherly skills to this um what we what we need for computing is some sort of instrument that will make a choice for us a switch in other words, and any the okay. early one, yeah, the the early ones were mechanical. You know, you you turned a handle and gears maneuvered and things fell into place, and then a number came up <laughs> in a red, and and they were fine but quite slow and clunky. So as soon as possible, the, the switch was made to electronic switches. And the earliest ones of those were valves, you know, they, they look like a, an old fashioned uh, light bulb, you know, mm. the, mm -hmm. the incandescent light bulb sort of thing. And th so they're heavy in consumption, they take up a lot of space. And we were all very pleased that transistors came along, where uh, size immediately di diminished. You, you may remember if you're old enough, early transistor radios, where instead of being a box in a room plugged into the mains, you could suddenly carry a, around a radio, which was battery powered. Mm. So the, 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 the mission is to get the switches smaller and smaller and closer together so that you can get more of them in a, in a space and they can talk to each other very quickly because there's no distance between them. And that's what we've been doing with, with chips, you know, actual silicon imprinted chips. And uh, Moore's Law noticed that, Mr. Moore, whoever he was, noticed that these were improving at a rate. And that's where his so-called law uh... came from. 
But I, I think that we've probably come to the end or near to the end of the progression that Moore spotted because there are problems. Um, Tim talked about getting down to atomic level. That well, there, are, there are problems even before you get to that atomic level because putting them closer together where they're consuming power means they get hotter. And the whole thing, you can fry eggs on in the end. And, and then the problem becomes, how do you keep them cool? And you've got to carry them around in a refrigerator or something. And the other problem is they leak current across the very small gaps. So the message gets jumbled. I think John should be the special guest. He's doing a better <laughs> job. <laughs> doing a much better job of explaining this. <laughs> He's a teacher, you know. You know, you know Tim, um, Timothy. It's Tim's it's fine. a gift to be able to explain things to people. Um, and, you know, and, and and John, you'll understand this um, in the way it's meant. But it's my hypothesis that those of us who are not the smartest in the uh, we have, if you just sort of not too smart but not too stupid, then you have this ability to grasp complicated things just enough so that you can explain it to somebody else. Because if you're too smart and if you just catch things and you just understand it without having yes. to work through understanding it, then you have yes. no idea how to explain it to other people. Uh, well, so, so that. That's a very good uh, description of how I feel about things because I'm not an academic. I'm not a nerd, but I'm and I'm not dumb, you know, so I'm I'm in the middle there and, and I can translate from nerds to ordinary. Well, well normally the, you, you've also had to teach younger people like I was teaching graduate uh, students mostly. Yes. So these people already, at least ostensibly, had computer science degrees. Yes. Right. Yes. Um, you know, and when I taught undergrads, they were even smarter. Um, so, uh, but, yeah, but, you know. it's, it's, but is it slightly embarrassing when you have in your class somebody who's cleverer than you? <laughs> but that's no, I, I, I just hire them to do to do research. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, um, before I uh, talk about artificial intelligence, because what the comment that I just made I think leads on to. Oh. deep learning and machine learning but steve sent a question on the message now i i'm a fan of noam chomsky so i used to be um and uh, steve says that uh, noam chomsky has often said that ai and deep learning should focus more on language than statistics yeah. uh, so uh w what's i, I well I know too little to have a, a firm to be able to make a firm comment on that, but it makes sense to me. And I'll tell you, I just I'll tell you why. I think language is still the most complex uh, structure. I think language is even more complex than than many biological structures. And I think computers and AI have a long way to go before we can get to that real deep learning. And me, being an Afrikaans speaker, you know what my brothers and I, or friends and I sometimes do when we want to have a good laugh? Then we have a conversation in Afrikaans over Google Meets with the captions on. <laughs> and that is absolutely brilliant and hilarious to see what Google makes of the Afrikaans words and how it creates, <laughs> creates captions. So there's really something special about being able to converse in another language. But so, so the, the, I think, what do you say to that, Tim? Well, okay, so, um, you know, I have studied linguistics and yes. I did a little bit of computational linguistics and um, there was still a lot of statistics that went on in that. Okay. <laughs> so um, most of the AI that I did was machine learning and abductive inference. So um, and those were both like a lot of numbers like um, so, you know, like with machine learning, take a neural net. What you're trying to do is train a model. You have a system with a bunch of knobs and you're trying to figure out how to turn those knobs yeah. so that you get the output for the input, you know? Okay. So, um, so you know, when, when you're doing language um, for 
decades, people were trying to do uh, language and computers using um, uh, sort of, I'd say, analytical models, right? Or trying to model a grammar or when you're yeah. doing um, speech recognition, then there's some knowledge of phonemes that you build yeah. into your model, okay? Um, it basically, we're using expert domain knowledge from linguistics to develop a mathematical model for interpreting the audio signal to try to get language out of it. And then, but then neural nets took over and everybody threw all that away. <laughs> <laughs> and so, what are neural, neural nets? Um, okay, so. You, uh, let's see how well you do this time, Tim. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. So. No, um, no. <laughs> See, I this is one of these things where if you know I need a whiteboard, you know, for for uh, just, you know. So if, if it's taking too much time, just say, "Look it up, man." <laughs> well, okay, so okay, how should I put this? Let's start with the simplest kind of neural net. Okay, it's a linear th the thing called a perceptron, um, which basically comes down to a um, matrix multiplication. Okay, so. Um, I have a set of inputs and I had, and okay, so I'm making, a, I'm first, let's start by being a scientist and collect data. Okay. So I have a phenomenon that is being observed in the world. And then like, say there's some human interpretation of that. Okay. And so I would like to train a computer algorithm to take this raw signal and produce as an output, the human's interpretation of that data. Okay. Like. Here's a picture and there's a cat in it, okay? So I wanna simulate some part of the human visual cortex and domain knowledge of animals, okay? Um, and so with the simplest kind of neural net, basically what I'm doing is I'm taking every input and multiplying it by some number and adding them up and that's one of the outputs. Mm. And then I'm taking every input and multiplying each one by some other numbers and adding those together and that's another output, okay? And so this is, basically a matrix multiply, okay? But how yeah. do you determine what the matrix values are? You yes. use a, a, a method called gradient descent where you, you have an input and you, you start with this, you start with the, say these numbers, we call them weights, okay? They're like the synaptic weights between neurons in the brain, okay? Um, okay. Right, so, um, you know, basically, uh, you know, for, for an input, it's got some number, and let's call that an activation. And then there's a weight that uh, that specifies its relationship to some output, okay? Mm. So so if I've got 10 inputs and I got 10 outputs, then I'm gonna have a hundred, well, 110 weights, okay? 110 because you also get a bias value for each one. So each input is multiplied by some number and then you add a constant and that's your output. So what are those numbers? Okay, we gotta figure out what those numbers are in order to get that input to turn into that output, okay? And so uh, there are um, learning methods that you can use to train what those are. So the the, the uh, basic way to do it would be, okay, so I'm gonna get real nerdy. You take the partial derivative of the output with respect to each weight, and that gives you, and then, so that gives you the gradient of the, of the, of the, of the weight with respect to any error that you get in the output, right? So you 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 take your inputs, you perf you perform these multiplications and additions, and you get some outputs, and those outputs are wrong. Okay, so you take the you take an output, and you have the difference between the output and what you what you get and what you want it to be. Okay, and you square that. Okay, so now you get a parabola. Okay, so your error is a parabola. Okay. Okay. Right. Okay. And All the right. nice thing about a parabola is that there's a minimum point at the bottom okay mm -hmm. so i've got this parabola shape that's you know is the, yeah. as I, i've got the error and this is the minimum point okay and so what i want to do is if i'm here i want the gradient so the gradient's going to point this way the gradient saying i am i am my direction relative to the error is is this direction and this magnitude so i'm going to invert it and multiply it by a small step value and change the weight in the direct it change the weight in the opposite direction of the gradient thereby reducing the error slightly okay 
And the reason I'm doing Slately is because I have lots of training data that I want to train this neural network on. And I want kind of like to average over all of the, the, the sample data, the, the training data. All right. So training data is like, you know, to, to, to be really, uh, to not give a great example, but the training data would be like all these photos and which ones have cats and which ones don't. Okay. Mm -hmm. So let's say you wanted to make a binary decision, cat or no cat. Right. And, and so you'd train a neural net that would take the image in and it would do a bunch of math and then would give you two outputs. One would be cat and the other means no cat. And when you're, 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 you, when you when you're using this neural network to make a decision, you figure out which output is higher, and that one tells you if it's a cat or not. And if they're both really low, then it's uncertain. Okay. So, so do you think that's what actually goes on inside our heads when we're identifying an animal as a cat? Well, what goes on inside the brain is a lot more complicated <laughs> than that. Okay. It's I mean, like quick, much quicker too. I think. Um, yeah. Uh, well, um, sort of. I mean, the the a, a neural net in a computer, especially with modern circuits that are designed to accelerate these things, they can actually do this stuff a lot faster. It's just that we've got millions and millions of years of prior evolution that has structured our brains with certain default configurations that allow us that make it um you know, facilitate mm -hmm. learning these things, right? I mean, we've got a whole visual system that just, you know, gets built up during gestation. That yeah. and and at that, you know, once once you're born, you just gotta start like learning what things are or you know, or how to label things, but like the basic hardware is there, right? And this is one of the things that limits um artificial intelligence is well, we want want to make computers like humans, but we don't know how humans work. I mean, we know a tremendous amount about how the brain works. Mm. So you can map the visual system from the eyes through various circuits that decompose the image and do edge detection and color detection and uh, detecting where where objects are and motion and all kinds of stuff, right? And it you know propagates back to the visual cortex, where yep. you can you basically if you attach probes to the visual cortex, okay, you could basically kind of work out what somebody was seeing. Actually, what's really interesting about this is that the same hardware in the brain is used for imagining things. So whatever yeah. it is that you sense, same hardware is used for imagination. So if you close your eyes and you imagine a unicorn, okay, That's you kind of get an image of a unicorn on the visual cortex. Like I remember yeah. this, uh, Aaron <laughs> Ra was debating Eric Hernandez, okay? And uh -huh. Hernandez was like, well, you can't just open up the skull and tell what somebody's thinking. And well, you actually can. <laughs> you can and I wanted to punch him, right? Because like, like so many things that he said about neuroscience were were so wrong, it was ridiculous. I mean, mind you, we well, don't. They, they, they were only only just recently found out to be wrong, because re reading what somebody's looking at is a 2017, 2018 mm. piece of research, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I like I'm not really up on the on the neuroscience literature, but yeah, it's a fairly recent thing that people have. So I think that people had a sense for that that was the case for a very long time, but actually being able to probe the visual cortex and like read out what somebody was imagining, that's recent because we just uh -huh. didn't have the technology, right? Uh -huh. And 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 I mean, Hernandez is kind of right in that we. Like if you're imagining a song, we don't know exactly where to probe for that. I don't know. You know, maybe yeah. we could figure out which neurons yeah. to yeah. probe and then you could hear somebody, you know, get an audio signal out. I, I you know, yeah. uh, that's yeah. probably the case, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah. So I haven't, haven't cracked that one yet. Yeah. But yeah. it's interesting. You were talking about the visual cortex because that can be redeployed by the blind to make to navigate by hearing. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. There's some some blind people who who figured out how to do echolocation. Yeah. Um. I remember that there that this was like in the 80s or 90s. I remember a show where, um, they made this thing to to attach to some blind person's back, and would yeah. like buzz their back in different spots in yes, like, yes. pixels, right? Yes. And so that that person was like, you know, I'd never realized that a flame, yes. has like a shape to it visually but yeah. they were finally for the first time in their life able to using see their, flame using this 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 thing strapped onto their back that, using their skin yeah. as eyes yeah I, I i there's actually research i'm, I'm not 
I don't recall where I saw it, but they where they have glasses um, for a blind person, and then it's attached to electrodes on the tongue, mm. and and that stimulates a visual sort of. I'm, I'm botching this completely, but but it's the same idea. But in this case, stimulus on the tongue is actually using create being, being used to create an image. Mm -hmm. But um, Tim, yeah, thank you for that explanation. Um, moving on. Uh, do you think we well, can... <laughs> before before we move on? I, I want to, I want to plumb into this a bit because uh, we we've, we've been talking about machine learning and and how it's different from human learning because we pick up a knowledge in our very early years about how things work. And machine learning doesn't have access to the sense organs that uh, would necessarily give it that information. So I'm wondering, could we make advances in AI, and this may be already being done, I don't know, probably being done in the military area where they won't tell us what they're doing, you know, probably there, um, where we could put in a sort of knowledge chip into the, the, the brain, the machine learning brain, as a basis of, you know, sort of, this is a cat type of stuff, <laughs> which, which you could then can build upon with its um, investigations. So you're talking about... Um for an AI system having a, a base set yeah. of knowledge? Well, I'm, I mean, people have been working on that for a long time. Yeah, um, yeah. That, you know, the, all, you know, Google and all these other companies that have some yeah. kind of machine learning uh, division are- but most, of, most of them are specialized, aren't they? They're, in a, they're, they're good at chess or good at Go or something. I'm talking about a general AI, mm -hmm. aren't I? Yeah, w I mean, we don't really know how to do that. Yeah. No. I mean, so, 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 but here, the, the, one of the problems that, uh, with general AI is that we're so biased by what humans do. And what mm. we do is the result of, you know, million of, of like a billion years of evolution from microorganisms up through, yeah. you know, reptiles yeah. and mammals that have, uh, you know, evolved these very complex systems, right? Like, yeah. um, you know, in, let's take emotions, for instance, right? Some, you know, relatively primitive, mostly mammalian thing in, in the brain. Um, you know, you, you watch uh, science fiction and people will, you know, write about some AI getting angry. It's like, but that AI doesn't have that genetic, that, that evolutionary history of it's having an emotion that was evolved yeah. for some survival advantage, right? Oh. So it just wouldn't have it. Right. You could program in some kind of simulation. If you wanted a general AI, you'd want to give it enough knowledge to be able to uh, reason over what us emotional creatures are doing and saying. But mm. it's it's not even really necessary. Right. Why would anger be a useful thing? Empathy would be a really useful thing to give to oh. a, a general AI. But but but, but the, what is general AI? Because mostly it's like, well, when somebody says, what's consciousness? Well, yes. it's that thing that humans do. I don't yes. know what it's going, what's going on, but it's that thing that humans do, right? I, I've, um, got the, I've got the answer to that. <laughs> well, I have answers what, too, but... <laughs> what is consciousness? It's the opposite of unconsciousness. <laughs> I, I was just, I was going to say, consciousness is that thing that we know when it's not there. <laughs> um, so, some interesting questions that are popping up. Um, so... We'll have to get to those. Um, oh goodness! <laughs> so yeah, I was gonna. Uh, I've lost. I, I, I've lost track of something I was gonna say. Anyway, uh, oh, consciousness, right? So, so I have actually put some thought into this. Um, when when talking about consciousness, um, people start with what humans do, which is like the most complex form of consciousness that we know of. It's like that's the wrong place to start. What we need to do is start at the bottom. What is the yeah. least sophisticated thing that we know of that we yeah. would consider to be conscious, right? What are its characteristics? And I started putting some uh, some things together on this. Like, uh, for like for instance, one thing you definitely need, which is a necessary but su but not sufficient feature, is recurrence or like internal feedback mm -hmm. loops, right? Yes. So if you have a neural net or some kind of, or any algorithm, 
if you have an algorithm that takes an input, does a bunch of calculations, and gives you an output, that thing can't be conscious because all it does is take an input and give you the output, right? But if it has some kind of internal state where it can where it can feed back or it has memory and can feed back, you know, what it computed back into itself and kind of loop, okay, then you know, every every system that we know of that has consciousness, let's say an ant has consciousness to some limited degree, right? Ooh. It has those things in its brain. Okay. Um, so uh there was there is um so you probably are familiar with um uh Friedman, Alex or Lex Friedman. Oh, wait a minute. Not yeah, the dreams of... a, yeah. And he had a guest on, his name was Yosha Bach. Um J O S C H A B A C H, I believe. And uh, I don't know if you want me to spend time on this, but there's a bunch of things that he said about consciousness that really resonated with me. Oh. And the, the 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 gist of it is, and, and a lot of the stuff I knew, but like the way he put it was was really fantastic. Um, we don't live in the world we live in a simulation of the world in our minds, right? So what we have is a model of the world that we're keeping updated based on our sensory input, okay? And, yeah. and we have to have that in order to function because if you because we need to be able to do things like hit moving targets and catch balls. We need to be able to predict the near future based on what's going on around us. And the only way to do that is to simulate the world, okay? So you know, you that ball is heading toward me. Where is it going to end up in a few seconds time so I can put my hand there? Or this elk is moving this way and I need to throw a spear, right? Where is it going to be, right? And all of that's based on a simulation we're running. Well, pretty much everything that we perceive about the world is a simulation that's sort of kept in sync with what's going on outside of us, unless you're like on drugs or something that's disconnected yep. the internal world from the external world. Um, so yeah, it, it, that stuff is really worth watching if you, if you want to get into that. Um, so there's like a two of Lex Friedman's, um, podcast. So, so mm -hmm. to what extent, what, what is the greatest limit in, in machine learning? Is it physical capacity as in not, not enough fast enough transformers, not enough chips, or is it in the programming side or both? So, uh, um, so there is to to a limited extent okay the the effect of the technology the capacity of the technology has an effect but its effect has to do with turnaround time in engineering okay so it, if we knew already how to implement a uh, general ai okay uh, and we implemented it on a modern computer it would be probably would be slow compared to a human okay yeah but you could do the job. I mean, we can certainly get a, okay. get the memory capacity, right? But um, but there's but the fact that it is slow limits our ability to like try things out and see how well they do, and then uh, okay. then learn from that and try another approach, right? Um, yeah. So so th there is that. So the the main problem is that just the lack of knowledge of how to do it, right? There's hmm. presumably some. Uh, many, probably many different ways that you could implement general intelligence. Humans have one implementation of it. It's really just algorithms of some kind. Uh, you know, I'm, I, don't, I'm not, oh. I don't buy into Roger Penrose's assertion that there's something quantum going on. The, the no. temperatures are too high for that to be the yeah. case. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so you we just don't know. We don't, well, we, we don't know what what the the general character of those algorithms is and you know well i've got a, a thought on this because i i don't think that um, there is necessarily a way forward thinking in terms of existing technology and algorithms because the the big difference between the human brain and and a processor chip is the hardware is too concrete. Whereas neurons can grow and die and reconnect and, but 
our existing processor chips are just crystals that have been doped a bit and they're, they're fixed. Well, the chips are fixed, but the algorithms that run on them are software. Yeah, like you, you, you have data and code and memory, right? So because of that, like, it, so let's say you, you, you're emulating part of the brain. I mean, a neural net implemented in software is basically kind it's of an abstract, a simu abstract simulation of, yeah. of a chunk of the brain. On okay. top of, on top of this fixed structure. Sure. And, but I mean, once we get the, what, but there are, there are, there are specialized circuits that are designed to accelerate neural nets. And basically they're like um, a systolic array of, it's a, a, a type of processor where you basically load the weights of the neural, the neural, the neural net weights into them. And it efficiently performs the calculations. And it's at a layer of abstraction higher than the hardware. But I mean, it's like so much faster than the communication speed between neurons in the brain. It doesn't matter. Right. Mm -hmm. It's just so, um, yeah, I mean, it's not it's not the architecture that matters so much as the algorithms that you run on it. And different architectures will have different performance characteristics. Mm -hmm. But as long as they're Turing complete, then they'll be able to execute any algorithm. It's just what diff what matter what the difference is, is the speed and the energy consumption. Mm. So, so Tim, you mentioned the uh, Turing compliant. So Compl I want to ask you, um, there was this very recently, uh, we might have known about it. There was this engineer at Google, I think he was consequently fired, subsequently fired, um, who said that some of, one of his programs was sentient. I don't know if you, uh, he, he, he made the claim. He said that this, this one set of programming was sentient and, and he actually broke a non-disclosure disagreement and therefore he was fired. But I heard this discussion on the Skeptic's Guide to the Universe podcast about this engineer claiming that his programming was sentient. And then one of the things they said was that the Turing test is actually not a good way to determine whether AI is sentient or not. So the question I have is, um, I have a vague idea of what the Turing test is, but do you think we have a test to test for sentience in AI. Uh, and if we don't, um, what would such a test have to be like? Right. So we'd have to have to have an objective definition of sentience and we don't have one. Okay. So, okay. so, <laughs> so, so uh, uh, the Turing test is kind of like peer review. It's, yeah. it's not great. But it's no. the best thing that we have. We have, okay. <laughs> right. there, okay. There are some there are some systems now that Turing would find very hard to distinguish based on his test from yeah, yeah. A, a live human. I I would say that it's a reasonably. Uh, I mean, I I I I don't. I don't. I don't think that we're really in a position to criticize the Turing test. Is in in that. Like it, it's a decent, well, okay. You can criticize anything you want, but it's like a decent approach that is a heuristic way of determining if something seems based on subjective uh, opinion from interaction, whether or not something seems to be sentient, right? But it, it it's like, um, you know, the Chinese room experiment where, you know, the, this there's this guy with a book inside of a room and you had him pieces of paper in Mandarin and he doesn't know Mandarin. So he goes up and looks in the book and uh, and and um, and, uh, and and figures out what the response is supposed to be and hands it back out. OK, and let's say that this book has enough information in it to make this room and the guy appear at this this Chinese room to appear sentient. OK, because there's enough information in that book, but he has no idea. Right. What any of this means. Um, and so people are like people try to use this as a basis for saying that, you know, well, there's got to be something driving the brain, some some supernatural thing driving the brain, because all we've got is these these not is these neurons in there that don't understand anything. But I'm <laughs> OK. Um, but the thing is, that room. And the guy and the book together, if we say that that behaves like it's sentient, then what difference does it make? 
right? Yeah. It, it's what the, that that sentient machine has one architecture, and and then the human brain has a different architecture. But if they're doing the same thing, yeah. they're indistinguishable. <laughs> That's okay. It. okay. Yeah. Cool. So and, and like so people are like they want to say they want to distinguish between a simulation of sentience and sentience. And I'm like, but there is no distinction. Where yes. where sentience is a process of running simulations and doing That's algorithms awesome. and cal cal computation. That's what the human brain does. It's a computer made of meat. <laughs> yes, yes. So, so you know, and people are people are like, well, yeah, but I have this feeling that you know, <laughs> like, what's the feel the qualia of the color red? And I'm like, well, what's happening is that the visual processing parts of your brain are taking signals from your eyes and interpreting them in a way that you don't have access to, and then dumping the final results into your conscious awareness in the in yes. the short-term memory in your prefrontal cortex. Okay, that's where what's you, going on. So you don't you recognize it as red. Right. But you don't you have do you have access to a very tiny portion of the amount of activity going on in your brain? Only thing you have conscious access to is what goes through the short-term memory in your prefrontal cortex. That's it. Everything else is dumped into it by some other part of the brain. And it's like magic. It just magically appears. Memories just magically appear because some activation occurred in your neural, in your, in your neocortex that, you know, like, a pattern was recognized that activated a circuit in your in your neocortex, which is connected to some other memory that you know triggered that that then sent yeah. information to your prefrontal cortex and you became consciously aware of it, right? Yeah. But there's so much that we we do that we have no knowledge of. Okay, so um, if you learn a skill, okay, I'm really really good at debugging, and people are like, you should write a book on it. And I'm like, I can only tell you a, a small portion of what it is that I'm doing when I debug, right? There's a sort of a divide and conquer process that I'm consciously aware of. But the rest of it is I poke around at the thing until some flash of insight happens. Yes. And then I, then I go to a completely different part of the code that I'm not even looking at right now. And I find the problem. I'm yes. like, how do you, I can't write a book about that. Right. And, and, you know, there, there are people so, like John who, you know, have dedicated their careers to basically introspection. How do I do this? Let me watch myself. I don't know how I'm doing it, but if I watch enough, I can come up with hypotheses about what I might be doing. And those hypotheses, even if they're wrong, they might be good approaches, right? Yeah. Even if they're not exactly what, what you're actually doing, if they're an alternative solution to the problem, then you can go and, and teach that, right? And, and so teachers are in particular, you know, people who are good teachers are talented at this kind of observation of humans and of themselves and this introspection that's required to reverse engineer yourself. OK, and so so people like but it's really interesting, like looking at people and, and asking, why did you do this? And, and literally every time you ask somebody, why did you do this? They have to make up an answer because they don't know. They literally don't know. People do not know their own motivations, but, you know, people can be reasonably accurate about that because, you know, they've lived through their lives and they've seen, you know, things and they've, they've developed reasonable hypotheses to explain these things. But, what, but they're always 100 percent of the time, well, 99 percent of the time, making up a plausible explanation for why they yeah, did yeah. something. Yeah, I relate to that because the way a teacher works is you, you try to remember how you what the difficulties you encountered when you were learning that, and therefore maybe easier ways to explain and help people to overcome them. But thinking is all about modeling, isn't it? We, we can't do anything other than make up models in here that may or may not match with our observations of what's happening out there. Mm -hmm. and. Can never be sure that they are a perfect 100% accurate match. We just hope that they're useful at the state we've reached and that we may be able to improve them in future. That sounds like science. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. So, well, yeah, I mean, human brain is basically, despite all the flat earth stuff, um, you know, and things like that, the human brain is basically, you know, uh, uh, an, an abductive inference science machine, you know. Yes. Well, we yes. observe stuff in the world. We come up yes. with models and we hope that those models are reasonably predictive and we try to live on that. Right. Yeah. And then, and then, you know, like formal science is just that plus some bias limiting uh, uh, procedures. Yeah. And a lot of repetition. Yeah. 
which is a bias limiting procedure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, control for, for the investigation. Yeah. Wow. So you won't believe this, guys, but we've got uh, 15 seconds left of our hour. <laughs> it's all really? gone. Very, yeah, oh I my know. gosh. It's all flown by, and there was so much else we wanted to talk about. However, I'm going to I'm going to keep to the the promise that Free Thought Hour show is an hour. Okay. Otherwise, I, I will get a lot of objections from or, or refusals from people I invite who who say, you know, you kept that poor sod an hour and a half. Yeah, I I've my family's out of town. I got all the time, right? So if you wanted to extend it, I I could give you permission to do that. Um, yep. and that but doesn't bind speech. anybody else. <laughs> so. I, I would love us to rather do this another time. Okay. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because, it's my uh, audience who would have to give permission, I'm afraid. Okay. Yeah. But, so, but, but Timothy, it was amazing. Um, oh. if, if I can just say that the, if I, if I learned, if I understood one thing tonight, I learned a lot, but if I understood one thing and I'm very happy about that I, for the first time in my life. I've actually been able to make a connection between something I learned in maths at high school and real world, because I could yes. never understand what the point of all those parab yes. par par paraboles and the, the I, I mean, I, I did it, but I could never understand why do I have to mm. suffer through this? So I never applied it in my career, but I'm so glad that thanks to people like you who are really, really smart, you can apply that. And at least I now know that somewhere, some kid is sitting in a class and he's actually going to use that in the future yeah. to make yeah. me a smart robot so that I'm when I'm senile, my memory and my <laughs> brain can be reprogrammed. <laughs> so, so. It really is <laughs> relevant, all that stuff that seemed too abstract at the time. I wanted to talk about interfaces as well because I know that there are, there are some half men half cyber creatures now one one or two people have had chips implanted i believe one man's had it implanted in his brain mm. and 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 there's the prospect in the future of having you know that problem we were talking about the vocabulary you know you can understand the mechanics of a language but all those words there's a whole dictionary you need put it in a chip plug it in job done whoa i know kung fu <laughs> <laughs> yeah well anyway thanks yeah. very much sure Tim. oh it was one. a pleasure yeah next time we'll uh maybe make a more targeted set of questions or something you know? mm. i'll do Good some research some more research and i'll have a nice list of questions for you i've made notes here about the perceptron and uh, alex friedman and uh mm. the, uh, more about neural nets i need to understand it i don't understand it well enough and the matrix multiplier so <laughs> here we go next time <laughs> <laughs> till right, the next cool. time thank you for watching people and thank you for future watchers too and here's your outro say bye 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 bye